to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Today, we're going to talk about the sociology of dominion. But first, we're going to introduce ourselves. Please state your name and the movie that you think is the best in the Star Wars franchise and the movie that you think is the worst in the Star Wars franchise. Let's you start really with want you, me Greg. to make enemies already? <laughs> yes. Well, this is going to be a very divisive episode. Anyway, you slice it. So mm. figured we'd, you know, get it all out in the first minute or two. All right. Well, Brian's deep in thought. So I'm Greg Edinger. <laughs> and the best, obviously, was the first, which is number four for children, A New Hope. And the worst, I, uh, one, I don't even remember. Where are we in the series? Have we finished the series? I think so. We've had, we've had the original trilogy. We've had the prequel tw- trilogy and we've had the sequel trilogy. And the sequel trilogy just released its third. Okay. I'm yeah. now remembering it. I'm remembering how it ends. So the two before the final one, either one of them is the worst. Uh, the science was so bad in the first and the new trilogy that it was just... But it's a science you, fiction movie. Do you go to Star <laughs> Wars for, like, accurate science? I've never thought that. There's only so much suspension of disbelief that I can manage at a time. A galaxy far, far away with aliens that speak English, sure. But banking <laughs> against non-existent air, I can give you that. But... Light beams that travel faster than light across a galaxy and everyone on every planet can see them. No, that lost me completely. So anyway, (laughs) there you go. All right. Brian? Brian? Oh, okay. So this one will definitely earn me uh, at least Greg's disdain. My name (laughs) is Brian Broom. And well, he might not disdain me for one of my options. I can never narrow it down anymore, but my my two favorite Star Wars films are The Empire Strikes Back, which will garner no disdain from everyone. Anyone, everyone loves this movie. Mm-hmm. And The Last Jedi. Which, which is the which number um, is number the last eight. Jedi? Number it 8. Is number 8. Yes. I it think that its... was the one I watched in theaters and thought to myself, I am never coming to see another Star Wars movie. Mm. Is that where we meet Ray for the first time? That is the mm, her second the movie. The second one. The second yeah. movie. Okay. Mm, yeah, yeah. It has. But its what errors. did you like about it, Brian? This will also garner hatred <laughs> for me. Uh, I specifically really enjoyed Luke's and Ray's storyline together in that movie. The exchanges between the the holy trilogy, uh, so to speak. <laughs> I purposely avoided the other word that begins with the T and involves three. Um, <laughs> triad. Triad. Yes, the other triad of Luke and Ray and Kylo Ren slash Ben. I really enjoyed the writing between them. And Luke's story in particular spoke to me in a in a way that I appreciated. And I know that not a lot of people felt that way. But I I still look at the backlash it received and wonder why. I enjoyed the movie. So those are those. And as far as the worst one, I I don't think you can go worse than Attack of the Clones. What (laughs) on earth was that sand dialogue? And the thing. I hate sand. I hate sand. It's coarse and irritating. But definitely the way to woo the woman you have a crush on. Yes. Um, Maybe they're just put those so out of my mind that I can't even evaluate them anymore. There there are sometimes I, I forget that they exist and then yeah. I am reminded of them and I, I hate whoever reminded me of them. So <laughs> I, I feel that a movie that I have that response to is my, my least favorite of the Star Wars mm-hmm. films. Except when Weird Al is singing about the first Oh, one. yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. true. That's, That's the good. only good thing to come out of that movie. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're, for people who don't like Star Wars, we're wasting their time. So. <laughs> we're moving on now. <laughs> uh, so the sociology of Dominion. Uh, when we oh, wait, approach... Emily, did you answer? Mm-hmm. Did I miss it? Did I, I you answer? I didn't answer. Um, mm-hmm. I thought I got away with it. <laughs> um, so I think the best Star Wars movie. So 
actually the way I was originally going to frame the question was what is the best Star Wars movie and why is it The Emperor Strikes Back? <laughs> um, because that is what I think is the best Star Wars movie. Although I did ponder for a moment whether I would choose the original Star Wars instead because it's just such a straight up good movie. It's just fun. Um, and the worst, I do agree, is probably Attack of the Clones. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad we have that this much Pretty. common ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can agree on that. Okay, sociology so back to the sociology of Dominion. <laughs> uh, so the question that we're kind of trying to approach is how do religion and society relate or how how do adherents of religion advance that religion within the context of society? And Greg, you break it down into pretty much three options. What are those? Yeah, and they're by no means original with me, so kudos to the people who've used them first. I speak, they speak, we all speak of a power religion where the emphasis is upon consolidating all forms of power. We generally think of politics first, but it would include educational establishments, economic power, media power, whatever. If you want to make a good society, you need power and you need to force society to conform to your vision or goals by acquiring as many uh, bastions of power as you possibly can. Uh, secondly, the religion of escape or retreat. Society, it's toast. It's going to burn. Let's get out of here. Whether you're a Gnostic or a monastic or someone waiting desperately for the rapture, which should have come last Tuesday and for some reason didn't you're willing to let society go and it has no obvious place in your religious scheme. My contention tonight will be that Christianity is neither of those, that Christianity does influence society necessarily, but it does so in a more indirect fashion. It is not the goal of Christians to seize all of the seats of power and so, oddly enough, humanists can kind of back down a little bit. We're not out to grab everything this second. We have, and, and here's the reason. We have lives. We have work to do. We have stuff going on. Our families, our callings, our churches are more important than trying to save the world by some kind of political takeover. And that's very hard for the world to get. Because if they had all the power or the door open to all the power, they would walk to the door and take it because then they could do good. <laughs> And we're kind of of a mind of, um, one, it's probably not mine to take yet because I'm probably not mature enough. And, and two, do you really trust me with all that power? And should I trust me? And should I trust you? And is, oh, wait, I, I, I smell breakfast burning. I'll get back to you. Because, oh, and Johnny just threw up on the dog. We have things, real practical, everyday stuff, things to do. And taking over the world as a primary scheme of goal is, isn't there. It's not to say Christians don't get political at times. We certainly do. But when we get too focused on that, we tend to lose sight of Jesus and we tend to lose sight of the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus sent us to preach a kingdom, to be sure, but it's a kingdom that comes with repentance and regeneration and the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit based on Jesus' death and resurrection. And that's constantly what we're holding before a watching world or what we should be. And we're as tempted as anybody else to, to veer either after the reins of power or to run away from responsibilities. But when we're at our best and consistently as God works in us over months and years and decades, we tend to settle down to the same old, same old we can look really boring to the world. Maybe that's why they never portray us in their TV shows. <laughs> yeah. Charles Dickens has a character in his novel Bleak House named Mrs. Jellyby. Oh, yes, she is yes. My favorite Dickensian character. She's a crusader yes. um, for her cause. Um, this is the Victorian era, and everyone's very concerned about the heathen in Africa who need to be saved and get the missionary barrel sent to them and all that. And, and put pants on. And put pants on, yes. yeah. <laughs> and Mrs. Jellyby, Dickens describes her as having these huge hoop skirts that just knock over everything around her. 
And it's kind of a picture of her view of the world, that her view is so out there that she can't even keep track of the things around her. She's got these children that are just kind of hanging around, like attached to her pocket or just, you know, shriveled and neglected children that are just totally lost because she's out there campaigning to save the heathen and to feed the heathen when she's not even feeding her own children. And I, I always think that's a the picture in my mind of this religion of power of that we're going to go out and save the world, but we haven't even tended to our own responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I read Bleak House not long ago. My wife had read it and said how good it was. And she left it out on the uh, coffee table and one night, like three in the morning when I couldn't sleep, I wandered out there and said, huh, I was always going to read this. This will put me to sleep, I'm sure. And it didn't. I started reading and <laughs> saying, this is a fantastic book. And I'm, despite its thickness, I got to the end pretty quickly. Yeah. You don't even like Dickens, do you? Mm, you know, um, <laughs> um, Tale of Two Cities, Christmas Carol, I'm working on the others. But that, that almost convinced me, almost persuaded me to be Dickensian. Mm. But yeah, there, there's a good example of what happens when Christians stray into this idea of we can save the world by social or political action or economic action. Now, is it bad to, to collect money for the heathen? No, it's not. And there are better ways to do it than what she was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more that we've come to understand economics, we've, we've learned, let's not send the heathen blankets so that now we put them out of the business of making blankets, the one thing they actually could do and make money at. <laughs> let's... Let's uh, give them uh, no interest loans so they can um, obtain sewing machines and can make better blankets. You know, we're, we're beginning to figure it out little by little. And there's a place for the community of the saints that, that reaches worldwide. Mm. But sometimes we do have, we in the past have had the arrogance to think, well, we need to make them all like the United States or like England or whatever rather than really coming to understand what their needs are and how we can best minister to them, not necessarily as a superior culture, but more centrally as brothers and sisters of Christ. So that's a practical thing. On the yeah. other side, go ahead, Brian, did you want to? Just uh, taking one thing that you said about in instead of sending them blankets, which they can make themselves, yeah. that kind of attitude where you, you basically view yourself as this more enlightened culture who has to give these things to people in order for them to even have them mm -hmm. is going back to our discussion a little bit on Darwinianism. It's these people can't help themselves. We have to give them these things instead of actually talking to them like human beings who are capable of doing that stuff on their own. Mm -hmm. And finding out what can't they do on their own. They don't know how to make sewing machines. Okay, well, we can buy a sewing machine. I don't know how to make a sewing machine. That, we're unequal <laughs> but I have, a, here. I, have, I have some extra money, and so does my friend, and together we can, we can arrange to send them a sewing machine, which they, exactly. they can then do something with because they're not stupid people, and they can figure out how to use it just fine. Thank you. Essentially, you need to treat them like people who are capable of learning more than you know hmm. because – Otherwise, you're treating them as less than. Yeah. yeah. Have either of you read the book When Helping Hurts? Oh, I, you should uh, mention that. <laughs> I, I was just not, thinking about it. I have not read it, but I have heard the principles um, from one of the OPC's missionaries in Africa. Do you know the uh, authors? I do not remember their names, but a number of my students have used it for their uh, uh, term papers and such. Oh, so you have a very well-rounded view of... <laughs> book having read it and also read lots of papers on read it. lots of papers about it yeah but by and large my kids have enjoyed it and they i think it's been eye-opening to see that maybe the way that feeding our own need to be involved may not be the most helpful thing mm. to other cultures in a given time it's great that kids can go on short-term missions and get this exposure to different cultures and people sometimes but what if we send them down to build houses and in fact they really don't need those houses mm -hmm. and they have to but we've imposed on them and they're po too polite to say we don't need you go away and so they now are stuck <laughs> feeding the kids and housing the kids and keeping the kids entertained whereas the kids really aren't probably doing a whole lot and there's money that could have been spent to the professionals who actually understand the situation and know better where it 
might have gone. So we, we end up having to balance the claims of, yes, we want our young people to be involved in missions. Is this the best way? Do we really, we're back mm. to, do we really understand the practical and economic concerns that are going on here? Yeah. And uh, There's more, one, but let's start. <laughs> one, one of the problems I've heard specifically about short-term missions is that what they end up practically becoming is just a church-funded vacation. There's a danger. And yeah. I, I wouldn't want to paint with too broad a brush. But oh, no. It can happen, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But I've also seen kids come back excited about about missionary work. And, and again, that's great. But might there have been a better way and a cheaper way to have done that? Or a deeper way that got the, got, rather than sending 20 kids, that sent the two that were really dedicated. Yeah. Uh, something as simple as, and you will earn the money to go yourself. You will not ask people to give it to you. That might separate some from others. Of course, the, the private reply to that is, but they won't know until they've actually gone. So we're going to give them money. All right, fine, whatever. But at least <laughs> consult on the other end and see if they really want a bunch of kids crashing them. I mean, if, if, a, if a church in Peru sent a letter to your consistory spiritual council session, whatever you call them, and said, we're going to be sending 50 kids to you to help you um, refurbish your parsonage. You may thank us and uh, feed the kids and find things for them to do like vacation Bible schools. I think we would say, what? <laughs> Can, well, hold it. Can we talk about this? Uh, what, where'd you get our names? But we do that to, say, Latin American churches on a regular basis. Uh, we, maybe we need to stop and ask. Maybe people are doing that. Maybe the, the, the counter wave has had enough influence that churches have realized, yeah, we should do that. Maybe they are. But uh, in my younger years, I know that this, this was a real kind of thing that people had not thought through. And so when helping hurts, did, I'm sure the name of the authors will be in the show notes. They will they indeed. Will. They will indeed. <laughs> Let me give you, uh, having grown up in the uh, late 70s and 80s, let me give you my own experiences of the religion of retreat. We've been talking about power mm -hmm. religion. In 1976, Hal Lindsey wrote a bestseller called The Late Great Planet Earth. And in there, I will not say he argued, but more like strongly hinted that since Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948, and that the fig tree in scripture is a symbol of Israel and that Jesus spoke of a fig tree budding and shooting forth its branches in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, and said about the same time that this generation will not pass away till all be fulfilled. What Jesus meant was that Israel's going to be reborn and the generation that sees that will not pass until this great tribulation is done. So. Here's the math. A generation of scripture, and, and uh, Lindsay says it about like this in his book, scripture, uh, or a generation of scripture is about 40 years. He's right. So 48 plus 40, 1988. Subtract seven for the Great Tribulation. Jesus was supposed to have come in 1981. Now, he doesn't quite say that. For one thing, he was expecting it might even be earlier. But a lot of people could read between the lines. A lot of people began to speak of the budding fig tree without any clear idea of where it came from or how poor the hermeneutics are that, that give you that. And there was a lot of insistence. And I was in college about this time, finishing. Yeah, I just finished high school and was going into college. There were a lot of young people who were absolutely convinced that Jesus was coming back in their lifetimes and probably before the 1980s were done. I don't know how many would have held Jesus to a 1981 or 1988 date. But the closer we got to that, the more excitement there was. There was one guy who wrote a pamphlet that circulated everywhere, 88 reasons that Jesus is coming back in 1988. When Jesus did not come back, he rewrote the pamphlet, 89 reasons Jesus is coming back in 1989. <laughs> Is number 89, it wasn't 1988. <laughs> yeah, I, 
there you go. I, I never read through them all. I don't remember. I feel like that I, needs to just be updated every year. And yeah. <laughs> the next reason is it wasn't that year either. If... Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, the, the mindset in it, and, and Lindsay says this in the great, late, late great planet Earth, we ought to be living like people who don't plan to be around much longer. Now, he, he checks himself by saying, I don't mean anyone should quit college or give up their job or anything. Well, how? Why what not? Did you mean, yeah, <laughs> what did you mean and what do you think people are going to do? Maybe they're not going to give up their job because Jesus may not be coming back for a couple of years. But there were a lot of people who seriously decided that college was not important. There's no point in having children. Marriage could wait. I mean, Jesus... This was one generation, probably the, the, the most important since 1843 or so, that absolutely believed it was not going to die. Jesus was coming back. It was a fact. And anybody who questioned that was probably a liberal. That's how strong it was. And the attempt to alter or influence culture, liberal influences in church and state weren't there. The, the goal was to witness to everybody as fast as you could because the last person who comes to christ may be the last person who comes to christ that last soul was saved and the rapture comes and we're all out of here it was it was a mindset that people who didn't live through it may have trouble appreciating a generation with no future beyond heaven itself and uh, there's there's a lot of elements of gnosticism and neoplatonism there but it was all done in the name of Jesus. So here's another direction that Christianity can be steered into if we're not careful. Eschatology, it seems, does matter in the long run. Mm -hmm. I think some other tracks of this phenomenon are less eschatological. Um, we, look, we can look at monasticism, the Benedict Option. It's mm. a book that came out recently um, advocating for some measure of withdrawal from society for Christians. I think that's mainly a Catholic one. But... <laughs> I, I'm afraid not. because I think I, the I, author of Benedict, I don't think he's a Catholic. I don't think he's Catholic. Rod Dreyer? Rod Dreyer. Oh, actually, the name sounds... Uh, may, he may be Catholic. The name sounds sure Catholic. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I know. know. It, I mean, the name not... rings a bell of like Rod Dreyer, the Catholic guy, who does, whatever. I know it was not pointed to me by a Roman Catholic. I don't remember okay. the, uh, it was someone who was quite Protestant who pointed it out to me and said, here, here's something to consider. And, mm, no, thank you. We've been following the life of Abraham and I would like to, at this point, draw attention again to Abraham and Lot. We talked about this last time in terms of hospitality. I'd like to just step back a little, a little more and see what kind of man Abraham was. He's the father of the faithful, the father of all who believe. Three great religions claim him as their father on one level or another. But you know, when you look at Abraham, it's hard to figure out at first glance, at least by the world standards, why he was so great. He left civilization and went in the middle of nowhere. He had a large cattle ranch sheep herd concern going on. So that was good. He employed um, around 3,000 people, give or take. He made alliances with other sheikdoms nearby that at times became defensive alliances, but probably initially were simply for the purposes of trade. He must have been a great businessman because he got these complete pagans not only to trust him and respect him, but even to make a league with him, which means he was also doing some evangelism on the side because in order to seal a league, you had to swear in the name of a God everybody recognized, and Abraham would not swear by anybody but Jehovah, Yahweh. Um, and we know that everywhere Abraham went, he he built altars and he worshiped God publicly, called upon the name of the Lord, and uh, apparently led prayers in public and spoke of the promises because he had gathered souls in Iran and he had convinced some of his servants to become homeborn slaves and to join the vision. But beyond that, so he worshiped, and he was a good family man, by and large, except for that thing with Hagar. And uh, he was a good businessman. Once he did something really significant as the world record su such things, his nephew Lot became a uh, war captive and he gathered together his sheik friends and went after the retreating armies 
uh, outpace them, attack them by night with his homeborn servants, and took all their stuff, gathered them, and sent them running away, and got everything back. That's it. He did not pursue. He did not turn it into any kind of political move or military presence. He was going after a lot of his family. He got them. He came back. That was that. And then he went back to sheep and cattle. <laughs> and like Cincinnati? Yeah. <laughs> Except the difference is that Cincinnati moved in terms of the Roman polis, the city-state. He was faithful to that identity. Abraham was looking for a city that didn't exist yet. His vision was beyond the temple horizons to something only faith could apprehend. He saw the city of God. He saw the new Jerusalem. That's what motivated him. And mostly what he did, as far as scripture emphasizes anything, is he waited a long time for a, for a boy. <laughs> That's what scripture really underlines. Yeah, he looked for a city which hath foundations, its builder and maker is God. You don't really get that by reading Genesis directly. You have to read between the lines and understand the promise. He was waiting for a seed and concretely for him, that meant a baby. And he waited a long, long time to have that baby. And then God said, sacrifice the baby. Or as by then it was no longer a baby, it was a young man. So we look at that and we say, this is the father of all belief. This is the man who's going to change the world by doing his job and performing weekly worship and being a good dad and wife or husband, sorry, husband to his wife and making some friends. There are a lot of people who, who think Christianity ought to be more than that. We ought to take a more active lead in society, in social issues, in politics. We need to press the presence of Christ by um, compelling people, or at least strongly encouraging them, to adopt God's law. Now, people ought to obey God's law because Jesus is God and Jesus owns everything. But there's a difference between recognizing that and calling people to kiss the sun lest to be angry and saying, if I just get into positions of power, I can make it happen. The I, I think, is the thing that's scary, nice. followed by the make it happen part. We can serve God. Daniel and Joseph did, and they rose to great heights of power in their respective empires. But that's not how Abram lived. Yeah. Then we have Lot. Lot uh, went to Sodom. It was a, a cultural center, social center, political center. And he earned a place in the city gate as some kind of city official of some sort. And if, if people had asked, who's the greatest here? Well, they were both wealthy businessmen. But Abraham seems to have ostracized himself and probably a lot on occasion would say, you know, Brother Abraham, what's with this? You're, here's this society and we're in the, the ebb and flow of everything that's going on every day, the culture, the, the social issues, the politics, the the relations with other towns, you're out there in the middle of nowhere. You're having no influence. And yet Lot lost everything, and Abram became the father of all who believe. So as, and, and then we can look beyond that, and maybe move on a bit to, to Isaac after that, and Jacob after that, as to how they lived out this promise. But the writer of Hebrews sums it up very simply. They dwelt in tabernacles, looking for a heavenly city. They had no fixed city here, and yet these are the men who changed the world. And that's, the escape religion doesn't care about changing the world. The dominion religion just looks at that, flabbergasts and scratches his head and says, what are you doing? That can never accomplish anything. Um, history seems to have proven it wrong. It just takes a long time. <laughs> and this uh, this idea, too, of if, if I can get into the right position of authority, I can help make god's plan a reality and i'll be just this this wonderful useful tool for him it's really the height of hubris you know there's there's a difference between and let's think of daniel here daniel and his friends they're about 17 when they're going through babylon U, and they're they're forced to make a decision eat the king's meat have table fellowship with the king or not and they act very humbly they don't come up and say, hey, guy, don't you know we're God's special people? We're, we're, we're God's elect. We're the royal seed. You need to treat us better. We have a destiny. Don't you dare try to shove that stuff down our face. We're apart. We're separate. Instead, they went and said, um, can we not eat that? 
No, you have to, because it might be my head if you don't look at it. Can we make a deal? <laughs> they were willing to think, okay, I, we, I think we shouldn't do this. But we're under the judgment of God right now. Our nation's under the judgment of God. What if God has already deserted us to the point where this is all that's left? And so rather than insist, rather than start a food strike, let's give God a chance to show his hand. And they ask politely if they could have a short trial to not eat the food, and God honored them. That was that was really great. But it was also this... considerate to the to the man who's responsible for. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, they it could, could have be got his him head. in a long. It could. Yeah. They could have got him killed in the name of Messiah. They chose not to do that. They they tried to choose another. They did choose another route, and God honored them. But in the next one, the next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar the king has a dream. We've already been told at the, at the tail end of the first chapter that Daniel had skill in visions and dreams. And so here's a king who has a dream, and none of the priests and the magicians, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, can interpret it. Here's Daniel sitting there with his friend saying, huh, a king has a dream, and he calls all his wise men, and they can't interpret it. Guys, haven't we heard this story before someplace? <laughs> well, yeah, you don't think you're Joseph, do you? I don't know. <laughs> but... I know I'm Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm Daniel. And I, I know I've got these skills in dream interpreting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a 15 in dream interpretation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that does that mean that, that, that God's going to honor this? They stepped out in faith, and Daniel went before Nebuchadnezzar, again, humbly making the appeal that with time they could beseech the God of heaven. They, they operated in faith and said, if this is the voice of God, okay, here's the logic. This is the voice of God. We've seen the pattern before. Is there anybody else around here? Not that we know of. So let us make ourselves available. We, we, we have skills in this direction. And it may be that God will honor them. But they didn't just sit back and wait for God to pop it in their hands. They diligently spent all night in a prayer meeting beseeching the God of heaven. Mm. And God honored them. You can think also of uh, Esther. I haven't been called in to see my husband in a long time. I know he's the king, but I can't really help you because what if you're here for such a time as this? <sighs> Fine. Fast. <laughs> I'll fast. And I'll go in and if I die, I die. Yeah. Okay. Not not a lot of assurance there. There was no prophet that told her, this is what you have to do. And then Nehemiah, cut bearer to the king. Uh, be sad in the king's presence to get his attention. That's a risky one. That could be automatic oh, execution. Yeah. Did he have a promise? No. But again, like Esther, they can look around and say, is there anyone else? Well, God might raise someone else up. Yes, he might. What will God say to you, though, if you didn't try and you had the opportunity? And so while we need most certainly to avoid the hubris that says, I'm the only one who can fix this. I've got the, the ministry. I've got the book. I've got the tape. I've got the gifts. I've got the charisma. I can fix the American scene right now. We, and we especially with this little ministry we've got going, need to be very serious and say, no, we're, we're not that. But if God gives us openings, I think we're going to walk through the door, mm -hmm. not knowing what's going to be on the other side. What may be on the other side is a lot of people laughing at us and pointing fingers. Okay. <laughs> or screaming fine. for our heads. Or screaming for our heads. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, we Building have all a gallows of, next to their house for us. Yeah, we, we, we have this all on tape. You are responsible. We have evidence. Thank you for making it for us. You're welcome. One thing I do want to point out, too, is that Though the details for Esther might make it so that it turned out this way, what we don't see Esther do as a faithful Jew is immediately trying to institute Torah worship. Yeah. She mm -hmm. she makes re really no attempt to change the system. She no. may have evangelized her husband. I mean, I would expect her to, honestly. But... There's no power grab moment for her. No, no. And that's an excellent point. There's this mm -hmm. temptation. One writer's called it the dominion trap. 
of grabbing too soon for the robes of power before we have gone through the process, considered the consequences, and matured ourselves so that we actually can handle the power. Daniel and Joseph served their way to the top. So one step at a time. Joseph started in a prison. Daniel started as a slave, was put through a heavy brainwashing course. And God slowly in his time raised them up to positions of great power. And yet when they got there, as you say, they didn't try to impose God's law on everybody. Daniel offered Nebuchadnezzar some really strong moral advice from the Torah. You know, break off your wickedness by doing justice and showing mercy to the poor. And, and there may have been some more specifics we haven't been told about. I'm sure Daniel was of some help when Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem. It would be like Nebuchadnezzar to say, well, I got him, Daniel. What do you want me to do with him? Um, King, I have a plan. But Daniel doesn't try to, to overturn the system. Had he done that, all those people who conspired against him during the reign of uh, Darius would have had something to work with. Mm. But he faithfully... Well, he was faithful to the man in power. And both Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus later on were still carrying on wars of aggression all over the place. And Daniel was having to deal with the monies and the treasures that were coming in from that. And he was having to faithfully manage that. And um, that would be difficult for a lot of us as Christians. And there, there are the perfectionists among us who say, no, he should absolutely refuse or he should take control and uh, start manipulating the system so that in, in, in his case, he simply was faithful to his job while never deviating from his primary loyalty to God. He was willing to die where the issues were black and white. Mm. But in other issues, he was willing to be the servant to the pagan, trying to do what was best for his pagan lord. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know a gentleman who serves in and about the White House right now. And I know that he has been able to do a great many things that have benefited the church greatly. But there are limits to what he can do and to what he can say. He, he, to some degree, has the presidents here. And more to the point, the president can say, hey, make this happen. And he makes it happen. But very often, these are things that are benefiting the church, benefiting the pro-life movement, benefiting freedom. But they're not things you hear about mm -hmm. because our president is really good at being loud and noisy in some areas while very stealthily doing other things that we will not talk about. <clears throat> I'm not even probably supposed to be talking this much. If you're listening, my friend, no, I did not use your name. Uh, <laughs> I'm reminded of a couple of things, if I can jump in. You talked about seizing, seizing the reins or seizing the power before your time. And I'm reminded of the magician's nephew, mm. uh, the first, not chronologically First. <laughs> chronologically first but not written first right yeah, yeah the yeah. first in a singular sense of the narnia stories where aslan sends this boy diggory to go and retrieve a piece of fruit from a walled garden with a gate mm. um never heard that story he... before <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> quite a and... pair hmm that was just an, a veiled reference oh. to August, Augustine. Sorry. Oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> I thought it was Augustine. But, so Diggory, the young boy, gets to the garden and sees Aslan's foe, the witch, sitting on top of the wall, eating a piece of fruit. And she's like, it's really tasty. You should have some. And what C.S. Lewis is doing is drawing the contrast between jumping over the wall to get it and just eating it right there. And opening the gate, waiting for the gates to be open, waiting for the moment to seize mm. the fruit, waiting to take the fruit back to Aslan and giving it up, knowing, well, backstory. Lots of backstory. You should well, just read the, key, the magician's the key, nephew. The key of the backstory is the temptation is it can save his mom. Right. The fruit is the fountain of youth. Yeah, yeah it, will, it will save his dying mom. And so the temptation is... But you can use this thing to do great good, to save someone you have a real commitment to, a God-ordained commitment to, um, and to bring life. And how what, what an ungrateful child you would be if you didn't, as opposed to, who knows what Aslan wants it for? It doesn't matter. What matters is your mom. <laughs> and he has to submit to the due order. He has to submit to Aslan's command. Now, as a result of all of this, of course, the mom eventually is saved. 
But he has no assurance of that. He has mm -hmm. to walk by faith and trust that God knows what he's about, whether it's something we like at the moment or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that's a lot of what we're talking about. The and, and we can we can draw back to paradise. Yes. Where Adam, who's supposed to be the image of God, but it's something you grow into maturing as one decision at a time. You place self-will beneath the will of God. You refuse the tree, whereas Adam was tempted to grab for godhood by eating of the tree immediately. No patience, <laughs> no, no discipline, no self-denial. Sometimes, sometimes the decisions are not clear. This is why yes. we need wisdom. Sometimes we're, we're, we, we have to say that our, our, our elders come to us and say, Brian, we want you to be an elder. And uh, yeah, what do you say? You say, wow, that's great. Thank you for finally recognizing my deep spirituality. <laughs> you I'm say, I think what actually no. happens, if you're reading the description of what an elder is supposed to be like and the responsibility that yeah. they have to do, you're thinking, I don't want this job. That probably you know, means you're a good fit for it. Uh. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I didn't want the job either. And I think if I could go back and do things differently, I might do things differently. But, <laughs> I, but I refused it many times before then because, because I, I can look at my spirituality and laugh. Well, and that that's part of the thing. We're talking about taking up the reins of you know various types of power before you're ready for it there's a reason they're yeah. called elders they're supposed to yeah. be proven in the faith yeah proven <laughs> in the faith have some kind of maturity and um, uh, as our church has looked for new elders I've, I've come to young men and said have you have you considered church office and i'm ready for the well yeah but you know when i'm older maybe i think that's an appropriate response or even wow yeah i have it it scares me silly <laughs> but what I wasn't ready for was the one attempts when I got the response. No, I really haven't thought about it at all. Um, why not? I'm not asking you if you are ready to be an elder tomorrow. I'm asking you what you think God's plans are for you. And we should all be looking, whether you're younger like you folk or you're a little bit older like me, we still look to the end of our lives and say, as far as I can see, I've got time. What am I going to do with that time? How am I going to grow? What might I be ready for in 5, 10, 20, 30 years? We, we, we shouldn't assume we will always be as immature as we are now. We may never be able to boast great amounts of maturity, <laughs> but certainly we should never be content to be where we are now, next week or next year or next decade. And so in all of this, we're, we're looking this this religion of covenant faith, the Christian religion, is one of growing sanctification. But sanctification comes as we hit hard things and learn to trust God, die to self, and pick up daily, often mundane, boring, tedious responsibilities. How many times can you mow the lawn, change the diapers, do the dishes? And still come back tomorrow and say, "Yay, more dishes to do! I'm so excited!" Oh, I already failed that one. <laughs> <laughs> and well. also to to draw to the other office, which is that of the diaconate. Their job as a as a as a member of the church leadership is to see to the physical needs of the congregation. It's yeah. a a complementary set of tasks that the church has to fulfill next to the roles of eldership. Right. So the the diaconate has these stewardly roles over the physical needs of their congregation. Mm -hmm. That is a it is a more obviously servant service oriented task and one that is also somewhat present in the life of the elder. They're they're there should be hospitality on the part of the elder as as much as there is uh, acts of mercy on the part of the deacon. Mm -hmm. But these kinds of things are not what people immediately think of in, in the secular world when it comes to authority and power. Right. Yeah, Jesus yeah, said himself the service. forward as a service. servant. Yeah. I am as among you as one who serves. Um, the Gentiles exercise dominion over one another will not be so among you. And I think sometimes people get this wrong. Oh, you mean if I serve long enough, then I get to be in charge of everybody? <laughs> no, that's no. No, the, the longer you serve, the more you get to serve. And even if you do, there's this thing called servant leadership. 
Yeah, yeah you, yeah. you get to be yeah. a better, more effective servant, probably with longer hours and more headaches along the way. <laughs> um, but this, this is what Jesus did for us and what Jesus still does for us. He didn't sit down at his throne saying, well, I'm glad that's over. Now I don't have to worry about those people anymore. We are still his constant concern. He's constantly praying for us, interceding, constantly uh, hearing our prayers and regulating every aspect of our lives for his glory and our spiritual good. He didn't, he still serves us. He hasn't stopped being a servant king. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big things we're trying to get across here. When grabbing power so you could be in charge and remake the world that's not christianity that's not even what jesus did and he's god <laughs> yes he's remaking the world but he's doing it by his blood and resurrection life not by ex by pressing upon a sheer power and and unmask authority mostly it's by the preaching of the gospel and deeds of love and kindness and there's a hymn that says something like that not with swords out of cashing nor role of stirring drums but with deeds of love and mercy the heavenly kingdom comes and of course it's more than just the acts it's the gospel the preaching of the word but those practical acts of service are key to what christianity is and here we can footnote and say see previous discussion about hospitality mm -hmm. one reason that hospitality is so important to christianity being friends opening our homes sharing our lives with people uh, it's a hard thing and i i don't profess to be great at it but it's something we have to go on learning to do and go on being better and better about as we get older and older i was not raised in a church or a home where hospitality was a big deal like to say i was largely non-existent in many in many respects so in that we at least open our home you know once a week for bible study and we have 15 to 30 people that's a start but it's only a start there's so much more and so we can hope that our children will, will do better than that and their children better still and so little by little and this, this, this little by little thing is a figure throughout scripture the power of religion wants everything fixed now Give me the power this this the injustices the inequalities are are unacceptable and any delay is compromise if you're not part of the immediate solution you're part of the immediate problem give me the power and i'll fix it and you christians are compromisers because you're mm. you're you keep saying well it it will get to it it'll happen eventually um on the other hand uh, the escape religion is yeah that's those are really horrible problems glad we're out of here bye <laughs> and so we rely not on status power not in revolution or, mm -hmm. or, or grabbing for the the robes or reins of power but by living out our relationship with jesus in a practical real way with real things real world jobs and ordinary people and we change the world but it does take a long time mm. and um we have to be okay with that but we can't go to the other extreme and say, no, no the, the changing isn't important, just your walk with God. Well, if your walk with God isn't coming out into your actions, there's something wrong with your walk with God. And we have to insist on that too. And we'll go back to our previous discussions of the image of God and man and the whole concept of the New Jerusalem. God deliberately put us in relationships with people, in hard relationships with people, so that we can grow, so we can be challenged, so that we can learn to hope and to humble ourselves and out of that process things happen things like marriages and babies and schools and hospitals and paintings and music and good beer and wine and pizza never forget the pizza anyway. <laughs> yeah our friend maggie the artist who gave us our cover art has a a saying from the polish she has a, a polish grandmother who would say pomalutku and I've probably totally mispronounced it, but it means inch by inch. And mm. so it's kind of one of her mottos is inch by inch we get there. And with that, I think we have to transition to recommendations because we're out of time. So, mm. Greg, do you have a recommendation at hand? Brian, do you have a recommendation? <laughs> I do. I have a list that I started keeping. Good for you. Uh, and this is one that I've 
I actually thought of recommending for like the past three episodes and every single time something else happened that week that I was like, I have to share this instead. So <laughs> this week I am recommending cast iron pans and cooking Ooh, yeah. utensils Amen. of that kind because they are amazing and I will never cook a steak on anything else ever again. Okay. Well, you know what? We just were forced to get a new frying pan because we were using our old one at super high temperatures, only appropriate for cast iron. Ah. So, so we have now become more conscientious about using our cast iron skillet. So you're, we've adopted your recommendation before you even made it. Uh -huh. you <laughs> uh, but I'm going to go, I'm going to change things up and recommend a recipe. Oh, yay. It's, a, it's asparagus. asparagus. Do you like asparagus? Who likes I asparagus? do not. I okay. dislike asparagus. <laughs> All right. So this one's I, not for me. It depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> Try this. If you take your asparagus and you all know how to do the, the, you break it in the right spot and throw away the hard woody stems. And then you <laughs> chop it up in about, you know, finger, um, an inch. Yeah, I'm looking at my finger where it bends. Uh, not an inch, <laughs> less than an inch. Well, okay, somewhere in there, a little less than an inch. You chop it up. And you mix some butter and some olive oil, just a little bit in the bottom of a, of a skillet and get it, begin to get it hot. You put in your asparagus and then you um, scrunch, what's the word? I'm looking at my daughter. Gar no, the no. garlic. Press, press the garlic. You press, the, press some garlic into it. Garlic is always good. And then lemon juice. Mm. Really important lemon juice. And you can even throw in... Some lemons. You can also at this point also throw in some mushrooms if you don't mind mushrooms, mushroom slices that is. And then the thing that really sets it off, red pepper flakes. Ooh. Just sprinkle them mm. in liberally. And then depending on how soft you need personally for the asparagus to be, my wife likes it very crispy. To me, that's not cooked. So that's <laughs> a fam family discussion there. But cook it, cook it as much as you need to cook it. And the taste is wonderful. And I think even people who don't generally like asparagus, by the time you're done with the lemon, the garlic, and the red pepper flakes, <laughs> it doesn't know it's asparagus anymore. And it's just great. And how do you um, cook this? You saute it rather quickly. Saute. In the okay. Yeah. You know, uh, in butter and, and, and olive oil. Now, where this really came from is this was a recipe for shrimp. Oh. And you, you put fresh shrimp in and you just you know flip it a couple times and pull it out. But as I was doing this, I said, well, I have this asparagus. What happens if, and it worked great. So there's my recommendation, a recipe for people who want to find a new way to use asparagus. Emily, how about you? Find a way to like asparagus at all. <laughs> I, that sounded so good. And I don't like asparagus or mushrooms. So, you know, it sounded good when I think, oh, man, yeah, those asparagus and the mushrooms. Um, my recommendation is the bullet journal. Actually, I'm going to nestle that inside of a larger recommendation for the blog website Redeeming Productivity, uh, which is ah. kind of a Christian productivity blog, as you might have guessed from the title. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually wrote up a summary of how I use the bullet journal system for productivity. I don't know. It gets it's real real nerdy, you know, sometimes when it's like, <laughs> oh yes, this is the system that I use to organize my life and get everything done. But the bullet journal is the single most helpful tool that I've been able to use in the last five years uh, to help me be more faithful in each of my callings. It helps me not forget things that I'm supposed to do, helps me to remember who I need to reach out to. I live a long distance from a lot of my friends, so I have a little list of like, oh, when was the last time I talked to so-and-so? I should call them. And it's just a wonderful tool. It's very flexible for a lot of needs. So I'll put my link to the explanation in the show notes. There's okay. also a book called The Bullet Journal System by Ryder Carroll, um, which I will link as well. Okay. Uh, wear your discerno goggles as you read it. <laughs> um, but the system I have found to be a great blessing. So The Bullet Journal. I may have a couple of recommendations that require the discerno goggles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think in general, we should always be wearing those. Yeah. Very I, true. I, I think for everyone listening, the assumption here is that you are always wearing your discerno goggles and that just because we think something's cool doesn't mean we don't know the problems with it. It's just that right. we think 
that we are wise enough to avoid them. But you can point it out to us. If now, if you even mention this, you're in league with the devil. You, you can you can tell us in an email. Yeah, <laughs> let us know in our in our email inbox, which you can reach at haltingtowardszion at gmail dot com. You can also visit our website if you like. How's that for a transition? Anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. You can like our Facebook page. We post our episodes there weekly and all of our show notes are there. Um, and you can send us a message there if you want as well. That works just as well as the email address. You can support us if you like by buying books through our Amazon links in the show notes or by giving us a one-time gift through PayPal. It's paypal.me slash halting towards Zion or a recurring monthly gift if you would like to do that. You can find that button on our homepage. Talk to me on Goodreads. Send me all kinds of good book recommendations. I think that's it. Thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate this time every week. Enjoy talking with you. Likewise. Likewise. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Bye.